This video is brought to you by Squarespace. There isn't much that strikes fear into the hearts of multi-billion dollar studios and their executives. Not strikes, not pandemics, and not the terrible ideas and scripts they greenlight. There is one object that makes them squirm in their penthouse office chairs. The omnipresent tomato. Rotten tomato record. Rotten tomato tomato meters for it. Rotten tomato. Rotten tomato. Tomatoes is Howdy. here. Hello. And you critics, you don't make the movies, you just say bad things about them. Rotten Tomatoes has become something of a mythical being in the industry that studios have fought to control, manipulate, and blame for their biggest misses. But since its creation in 1997, it has completely revolutionized how films are rated, critiqued, and has now become a trusted and influencing source for the moviegoers around the world. But how did Rotten Tomatoes come to be? Is a tomato a fruit? or a vegetable, who knows really. Let's dive in and explore the history of Rotten Tomatoes and why studios fear it so much. The idea for Rotten Tomatoes emerged when founder Sun Duong and his friends Patrick Lee and Stephen Wong were working as website programmers with a company called Design Reactor in 1997, originally starting off as a bit of a Jackie Chan fan page because of the upcoming film Rush Hour. Rush Hour. We can hang my crib. I will show you my hood. What the hell did you just say? Sen began what became Rotten Tomatoes by compiling pre-release news about the film from all sorts of different sites all onto one page. But Rush Hour ended up being pushed back. So Sen decided to go through the same process again for other movies, putting together collages of articles and pre-release reviews for new releases as a hobby. The final site was cobbled together in only two nights by Sen, who put together its key ingredients, a system that would gather up movie reviews and the labels used to score the movies, with a 60% threshold of positivity deciding whether or not any given movie was rotten or fresh. In December, the scoring system got its name, the Tomato Meter, and we'll get into exactly how that scoring system actually works later on in this video, which is a bit different than you might expect. But how did Rotten Tomatoes actually get its name? Well, that was inspired by a movie called Leola. In this movie, a woman falls into a bin of tomatoes and ends up getting pregnant from the tomatoes. Thus, Rotten Tomatoes. How are they rotten? Well, go check that movie out for yourself if you're really that interested. But the site quickly grew in popularity and even received an endorsement from film critic Roger Ebert. And soon the studios themselves were taking an interest, glued to the site whenever their new films came out to see how they were being reviewed. With all the success in 1999, the trio reached out for investment and the Design Reactor team moved on to the Rotten Tomato project. And in 2000, Rotten Tomatoes was officially incorporated. But shortly after, disaster struck with the dot-com crash, where many online platforms crashed and burned in the face of an economic recession. The Nasdaq index in freefall down nearly 10%. It lost a quarter of its value in just one week. Once this body started in motion, it was very, very difficult to get, put the brakes on. And by one o'clock, everyone threw in the towel and said, this is a foregone conclusion. These things are going down. Rotten Tomatoes only narrowly survived after laying off 18 of its 25 employees, leaving most of the former design reactor team behind, with the remaining seven members of the team taking pay cuts or forfeiting their pay altogether. And the site finally would recover in 2003 when Rotten Tomatoes got to be the guinea pig for Google AdSense, the funding model which later exploded into popularity, bankrolling much of the internet and allowing the company to start hiring again. In 2004, Rotten Tomatoes became part of the IGN Entertainment umbrella. Then in 2005, IGN was bought by News Corp Fox Interactive Media. In 2010, they would sell Rotten Tomatoes to Flickster. And in 2011, Flickster was bought by Warner Brothers. In 2016, Rotten Tomatoes was sold to Comcast's Fandango Media, with Warner Brothers maintaining a minority stake. It's actually quite funny how this ended up into the hands of actual studios, considering they would eventually have a bit of a beef with the site that they kind of helped to create. To keep their main scoring system steady, Rotten Tomatoes developed a vetting process for critic reviews where only regular and active critics would be included in the mix of feedback that produces the tomato meter score, which kind of makes you wonder how tomatoes feel about having a scoring system named after them. 
Blob the Tomato grew up on a farm in rural Missouri, but he wanted to get out of his small town and change the world, so he went to the university and was the first graduate of his garden row and graduated with a law degree. But as he entered the real world, he didn't like what he saw. Tomatoes across the country, working hard to make themselves tasty and consumable, were not being compensated fairly for their likeness and were being used to enrich the corporate elite without earning their fair share. Hi kids, I'm Bob the Tomato. Hey, welcome back, it's 8.53. Uh, Matchety is with us, Matt Atchity from Rotten Tomatoes is Howdy. here. Hello. Blob knew he had to do something about it, but he didn't know what to do until he was watching some video on a dumb YouTube channel named Frame Voyager, and he saw the sponsor Squarespace, who is also the sponsor of this video. Squarespace, that is. Blob didn't normally like Frame Voyager ads, but this one spoke to him. He finally had a place to organize the tomato workers movement. Blob was surprised that even as a tomato, he was able to design a site easily with their brand new fluid engine system that lets you just click and drag your elements wherever you want. Blob could set up appointment pages for his tomato clients to help them with their lawsuits. Blob also set up his merch store on Squarespace to help get the word out. If you're like Blob the tomato, you should go now and check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to sprout, go to squarespace.com slash frame voyager to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Squarespace, so easy, a tomato uses it. Despite being a successful media outlet, Rotten Tomatoes has made itself some enemies over the years. In fact, some of the studios carried out studies to supposedly, supposedly, prove that Rotten Tomatoes was affecting box office projections and making them fall severely short due to bad scores, keeping audiences away. Finding that seven out of 10 people said that they would be less interested in seeing a film if it received a review score under 25%. This all reached a peak frustration for the studios when in 2017, several films that were projected to open higher ended up millions of dollars below opening projections. Pirates of the Caribbean 5, Baywatch, and The Mummy all projected at $90 million, $50 million, and $45 million openings, but ended up with 62.6 million, 23.1 million, and $31.6 million openings. And here are their Rotten Tomato scores, 30%, 19%, and 16%. And the flip side in 2017, Wonder Woman and Spider-Man Homecoming had a 92% Rotten score and exceeded their opening box office projections. All these results led studios to believe that the tomato meter had a powerful sway, some would say, too powerful, and they started pushing back. And Scorsese, the Oscar-winning director behind awesome movies like Goodfellas, The Departed, and so many more, spoke out against movie review sites, Rotten Tomatoes, and CinemaScore in a scathing article for The Hollywood Reporter. He writes, they rate a picture the way you'd rate a horse at the racetrack or a household appliance in consumer reports. So while all this is happening, some mold the idea of introducing stricter embargoes on critics or blocking early critic reviews altogether to stall the appearance of Rotten Tomatoes ratings and to keep audiences from being put off by negative reviews as a result. One Fox report described the approach as, consider not giving the critics a chance to slam you. And in some cases, they did just that. Emojis. That's my home. Sony helped the emoji movie of all movies, survive a disastrous tomato meter score by keeping a review embargo in place until only a few hours before release, locking its 7% positivity score from potentially wrecking bookings. And for Sony, this actually seemed to work out pretty well. Oddly enough, Rotten Tomatoes sometimes went the other direction too, holding back the critic score of Justice League until the premiere of its See It, Skip It series. Rotten Tomatoes folks have ranked the films that were best by the tomato meter, and they put a lot of factors, not just the score. So if you look on the rankings, the score is- Considering Warner Brothers' ownership over Rotten Tomatoes at the time, many argued that it was a conflict of interest. But all this blame Rotten Tomatoes gets for bad movie performances seems like an unreliable view promoted by biased studios who will inevitably look for something to blame when things go wrong. Well, I think it's very disturbing to me. I, you know, we've talked about uh, disruptive forces on this business and all the challenges that we're facing and the recovery from COVID, which is ongoing. It's not completely back. How much sway does Rotten Tomatoes truly have over the industry? One academic study set out to answer that question. They put it quite simply, saying, we did not find evidence that Rotten Tomato ratings affect box office performance. And a marketing executive for indie films was quoted by Vanity Fair echoing these sentiments even more bluntly, saying, you make a good movie. But this whole debate over the impact of Rotten Tomatoes ratings brings up another question that's even more interesting. 
How are the side scores averaged? To start with, here's an interesting fact. There is a chance unpopular movies might actually have higher ratings than popular ones. This is because, according to an article from the outlet Collider, the scoring system of Rotten Tomatoes has to convert all kinds of different reviews into the same metric. Some reviews use letter grades, others numbers, a score out of 5, 10, or 100, and some reviewers might not do any of those things at all. They sometimes just give a written opinion without a score. And so Rotten Tomatoes has to divide all these different review types into two simple categories, rotten and fresh or simply positive and negative. This means that a review that's bursting with enthusiasm for a film might be labeled the same way as a review that saw the film as just okay, or maybe a little above average. And a review of mild disappointment might get labeled the same as a review that buries a film in a tidal wave of hate. This combined with the fact that the site has, as we mentioned before, a rather strict vetting process for its critics, with contributors having to be members of a guild, a movie critic outlet, or have a high following among audiences. Meaning that you might not necessarily get the big picture when trying to judge the feedback of a movie from a Rotten Tomatoes critic score. And when looking at the audience scores, you might still come across this issue because it's not just the studios that play the manipulation game. Audiences do too. In today's Tech Bites, Amazon is suspending reviews of its new Lord of the Rings series on Rotten Tomatoes. It says the 72 hour hold is to make sure the reviews for Rings of Power are legit and prevent internet trolls from bringing down their score. One of the most infamous problems that comes about when user reviews are supported is review bombing, where communities exploit review systems to try and damage a product and a company, oftentimes by reviewing things they've never actually seen before or tried before. Rotten Tomatoes is no exception to this phenomenon, with one of the most ridiculous examples of it probably being the Star Wars Rise of Skywalker, which was hit with negative reviews 10 months before release, when it didn't even have a title yet and was still only known as Star Wars 9. To discourage this behavior, the site had to block users from making reviews on unreleased films in February 2019, and in May of the same year, they required users to provide details of their tickets before the reviews would count to the audience score. Maybe a little strict, but when I read a review, I'd like it to be from someone who's actually seen the movie and someone that actually exists. So while the world of movie reviews has its flaws, Rotten Tomatoes is still an interesting success story, and it's continued to be the most trusted source by many moviegoers on whether or not they want to spend money on the increasingly rising ticket prices. And given that it's one of the top 1,000 sites in the world, it's safe to say that Rotten Tomatoes will get to keep that pedestal. But if you like a little bit more controversy than a little Rotten Tomato can give you, go check out this video on the doomed production of Blue Beetle.